Hey guys, thanks for watching. Yvonne Blasquez here. Um, I'm going to try and keep this very short and sweet. Um, this got really kind of complicated, this topic, um, the research that I did on it. But I'm going to go ahead and list those studies at the bottom of this video. Um, we're taking a different angle today. So you guys know I'm a big proponent of fat loss. And obviously I'm basically living proof to that fact, being very, very ripped and shredded and lean. Um, and so what I'd like to focus on today is the benefit of being a better sugar burner or in other words being focused on sugar loss more than fat loss now the good news is when you focus on sugar loss you will actually boost fat loss indirectly varieties of spice of life remember that I want you to have that as a theme to this video um, basically what we're talking about is metabolic flexibility and metabolic inflexibility um, basically, metabolic flexibility is the ability to shift um, a fuel source based on a change in uh, diet. So when, when, we're in, uh, when we haven't eaten for a long period of time, the body's ability to shift from burning carbohydrates to fats is very swift. Um, on the contrary, when, we're eat, when we eat something, our body's ability to shift towards burning carbohydrates is very swift that's a metabolically flexible individual. Now, when, a, when someone is metabol metabolically inflexible, they tend to not be able to adjust. So what happens is their body doesn't burn as much carbohydrates when they eat, and that tends to create glucose intolerance or elevate or called uh, hyper, hyperglycemia, which is elevated fasting blood sugar levels or just generally fat, higher blood glucose levels. Um, and then also, they have an inability to oxidize fat at a high rate, um, even though they have high elevations of, of um, broken down fats in the blood, their ability to actually burn those fats is, is, is reduced. The point I'm trying to make is, is that if we go on a low carbohydrate diet or a ketogenic diet, if we don't, think of it this way, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't use your body's ability to burn carbohydrates, we lose that ability and we become insulin resistant. Look at the bottom of this video. There are studies showing that high fat diets can actually induce insulin resistance and I've read reports and blogs online. Um, about people talking about they have higher fasting blood sugar levels. You basically reduce your body's ability, you make your muscles more, more intolerant to glucose because, because they're not really burning it as much because you're not feeding them the glucose. In fact, the ability to burn sugars is a strategy used in, in diabetics. Um, it's a strategy used like exercising after a meal to help to reduce post-meal blood surges or blood sugar surges or to tame blood sugars. And it also, an exercise after a meal actually sensitizes muscles to insulin as well. Exercise is not important because it burns calories. It's important because it restores metabolic flexibility, our ability to use fuel. Um, however, in obese and in type two patients, um, they manifest greater rates of lipid oxidation or fat burning in skeletal muscle and are relatively insulin resistant resulting in metabolic inflexibility. Um, so what's interesting is also some studies of pyruvate dehydro dehydro dehydrogenase which is a enzyme that catalyzes um, pyruvate into acetylcoenzyme A to enter the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. Um, there have been studies that show that low carbohydrate diets um, that are high, high fat low car carbohydrate diets reduce, they, they um, deactivate the, that enzyme and so 
um, the body's ability to burn carbohydrates is significantly reduced. So I'm going to wrap this video up with the simple fact that I'm a proponent of doing fasted training as well as fed training. I've said this before in previous videos. I don't think there's anyone out there who really takes a, a dual a dual approach position on this. Again, coming full circle, variety is the spice of life, right? Well, I do both. I do fasted training because it's good to burn fat on the front end sometimes. And there's other benefits to fasted training and just generally extending an overnight fast. But number two, it's good to train fed. So after eating, it's good to train after a meal and fed training for me is I wake up, I have breakfast, then I go work out. Now, I may be blunting fat loss initially because of the meal, but I'm better able to handle blood sugar. I'm actually becoming a better sugar burner, which is important. And you start burning more fat on the back end. So you back load the fat loss. So Basically, when you have a nice carbohydrate-rich meal, breakfast, good carbohydrates for that matter, ones that are actually lower glycemic index, but also full of nutrition and have fiber. Um, you can have lower glycemic carbs that, aren't, that are void of um, you know, uh, nutrition and fiber. So, um, but anyway, typically not, but there are exceptions. That being said, um, exercising after a meal helps with blood sugar control. And it also allows your body to focus more on fat burning when you're not exercising. That's one of the big differences. When you train fast it, your body uses more fat for energy when you're exercising. But it may use less when you're not exercising. I'm not 100% on that, but it's a possibility. When you exercise after a meal, your body uses obviously more carbohydrates during the workout, which is actually a good thing because metabolically, you're in a position to actually train at a higher intensity. You're going to have a, a lower cortisol level, and um, your body is going to prioritize carbohydrate consumption the rest of the day. So if you train in a fed state, your body is going to store less of those carbohydrates later in the day as fat because it's going to, it's going to replenish reduced glycogen stores because when you train at a higher intensity, we burn through our glycogen stores a lot, a lot quicker. So... You store less carbohydrates as fat, and your body uses more fat for energy during the rest of the day. Why? Because when you train at a high intensity, when you have a carbohydrate-loaded state, your body doesn't want to use carbohydrates for energy when you're not exercising because you've created a demand for carbohydrates. Now your body places a higher priority on carbohydrates, and it, uses, it turns to fat for energy when you're not exercising because your body wants to hold on to carbohydrates for your next workout. You see how there's a science behind fed state training and fat loss? You can boost fat loss around the clock by making your body focus on storing carbohydrates in the muscle for your next training session. Now again, fasted training also has benefits by burning a little more fat during the workout and favorably um, creating a hormonal environment of lower insulin levels and so forth. Um, but again, a balance of both is going to be ideal. So we want to be metabolically flexible. We want to be able to be a good fat burner and a good sugar burner. The problem with low-carb diets is you lose the ability to become a good sugar burner. Bottom line, and that's metabolic inflexibility. So with that, I'm just gonna go ahead and end it. I'm gonna, um, many of you appreciate the slides and the graphs. I'm gonna go ahead and have those right now from various research studies. And please feel, please look at the bottom of this video for those research studies. Um, thank you for watching. Um, and you guys come to me for the cutting edge content and I, this is my passion and this is fascinating stuff. Um, I practice what I preach and, um, and I'm open to being wrong. 
uh, that's okay. But we have to go with what we know right now. And we also have to have a moderate conservative position on what we don't know. So um, anyhow, thanks for watching. Tune in next time. Studies dating back nearly a century noted a striking finding. If you take young, healthy people, split them up into two groups, half on a fat-rich diet and half on a carb-rich diet, within just two days this is what happens. The glucose intolerance skyrockets in the fat group. In response to the same sugar challenge, the group that had been shoveling in fat ended up with twice the blood sugar. As the amount of fat in the diet goes up, so does our blood sugar spikes. Why would eating fat lead to higher blood sugar levels? It would take scientists nearly seven decades to unravel this mystery, but it would end up holding the key to our current understanding of the cause of type 2 diabetes. The reason athletes carb load before a race is to build up the fuel supply within their muscles. Right? We break down the starch into glucose in our digestive tract. It circulates as blood glucose, also known as blood sugar, and it's taken up by our muscles to be stored and burned for energy. Blood sugar, though, is like a vampire. It needs an invitation to come into our cells, and that invitation is insulin. Here's a muscle cell. Here's some blood sugar outside waiting patiently to come in. Insulin is the key that unlocks the door to let sugar in our blood enter the muscle cell. When insulin attaches to the insulin receptor, it activates an enzyme, which activates another enzyme, which activates two more enzymes, which finally activates glucose transport, which acts as a gateway for glucose to enter the cell. So insulin is the key that unlocks the door into our muscle cells. What if there was no insulin, though? Well, blood sugar would be stuck out in the bloodstream, banging on the door to our muscles, and not be able to get inside. And so with nowhere to go, sugar levels would rise and rise. That's what happens in type 1 diabetes. The cells in the pancreas that make insulin get destroyed, and without insulin, sugar in the blood can't get out of the blood and into the muscles, and blood sugar rises. But there's a second way we could end up with high blood sugar. What if there's enough insulin, but the insulin doesn't work? The key is there, but something, something's gummed up the lock. This is called insulin resistance. Our muscle cells become resistant to the effect of insulin. What's gumming up the door locks in our muscle cells, preventing insulin from letting sugar in? Fat. What's called intramyocellular lipid, fat inside our muscle cells. Fat in the bloodstream can build up inside the muscle cell, creating toxic fatty breakdown products and free radicals that can block the signaling pathway process. So no matter how much insulin we have out in our blood, it's not able to open the glucose gates and blood sugar levels build up in the blood. This mechanism by which fat induces insulin resistance wasn't known until fancy MRI techniques were developed to see what was happening inside people's muscles as fat was infused into their bloodstream. That's how we found out that elevation of fat levels in the blood causes insulin resistance by the inhibition of glucose transport into the muscles. And this can happen within three hours. One hit of fat can start causing insulin resistance, inhibiting glucose uptake after just 160 minutes. Same thing happens to teens. You infuse fat into their bloodstream, it builds up in their muscles and decreases their insulin sensitivity, uh, showing that increased fat in the blood is an important contributor of insulin resistance. And then you can do the opposite experiment. Lower the level of fat in people's blood, and the insulin resistance comes right down. Clear the fat out of the blood, and you can clear the sugar out of the blood. So that explains this finding. On a high-fat, ketogenic diet, Insulin doesn't work very well. Our bodies become insulin resistant. But as the amount of fat 
in our diet gets lower and lower, insulin works better and better. This is a clear demonstration that the sugar tolerance of even healthy individuals can be impaired by administering a low-carb, high-fat diet. But we can decrease insulin resistance by decreasing fat intake.